Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is how to deliver a nuclear weapon. Broadly speaking, there are four answers to that question. One, make a fancy improvised explosive device. Two, use planes. Three, create land-based ballistic missiles. And four, develop submarine-launched ballistic missiles. In truth, there are only three options. That IED possibility, we should scratch that one off entirely. With an IED, you're placing a bomb somewhere, waiting for someone else to come across it, and then pressing the button to explode it at that point. Thinking about this in terms of nuclear weapons, that would mean waiting for an invading army to come through and then detonating it to destroy that invading army inside of your own country. But as we know, nuclear weapons don't just create explosions. They also create radiation. That radiation poisons the environment. And so if you're detonating a nuclear bomb on your own soil, you're going to be dealing with those problems much later into the future. So yes, maybe in an absolute emergency, you might turn a nuclear weapon into an IED, but that's not where you want it to be. Instead, you want to go with one of these other three options. What I'm going to do now is go through each of those in detail, starting with planes. Planes are the most basic option. They require little additional work because you can use your existing air force. All you need to do is modify a plane to carry a bomb. This is, in fact, what the United States did during World War II. They took the Enola Gay, a plane that already existed, they figured out a way to mount the bomb on it, and then dropped it over Hiroshima. End of the story. An advantage here is that planes can support large bombs. You don't have to figure out a way to make a nuclear weapon small. We've also seen this with World War II and the bombing of Nagasaki. This is Fat Man, as you will recall, and it is a very large weapon. Nevertheless, you can take a very large plane, like the boxcar, put that weapon on that plane, and then drop it over a city, like the United States did with Nagasaki. But planes have some downsides. For one, they can be shot down. With a plane delivery system, you are actually flying to your target, and then once you are there, you're firing the weapon or dropping it out of the back of the plane. That leaves you vulnerable to anti-aircraft batteries. It might also be the case that the opposing air force will scramble fighter jets to try to take down those planes. It can also take a long time for a plane to reach its target, depending upon where it's taking off. And if seconds count, that's a big problem. In fact, the United States went to great lengths to try to mitigate that time problem. This is a B-52 bomber. It was a key part of the U.S. arsenal during the Cold War. Indeed, during the early phases of the Cold War, the U.S. would fly these things nonstop. There were three routes the B-52s might take. A western route that would fly over to Alaska, a central route that would go to Greenland, and an eastern route that would fly all the way to Europe. By keeping the planes in the air at all times, the goal of Operation Chrome Dome was to drastically cut down on the time it would take to hit the Soviet Union. That's because, at a moment's notice, you could call in a strike from Alaska or from Greenland or from Europe, rather than having to fly the planes all the way from the United States to the target. You're cutting the time down in half. Another solution is to deploy your nuclear weapons to foreign soil. As you can see on this map, the United States has done this quite a bit. Every country in blue, at some point, has had a U.S. nuclear weapon deployed in its territory. For some of these nuclear weapons, we're talking about planes. Other nuclear weapons are going to be ballistic missiles, which we'll get to in a second. But the goal here is to get your nuclear weapons closer to your target by putting them in a different place. Countries like Turkey are very proximate to the Soviet Union. The United States is not so much. So by having weapons in Turkey, you're again cutting down on the time to firing a weapon and having it hit the soil of the country that you want to be destroyed. The United States wasn't alone in doing this, of course. The Soviet Union did something similar, although they did not deploy nuclear weapons to nearly as many places as the U.S. did. The second option is a land-based ballistic missile. These are just like conventional missiles, except you're replacing the normal explosive with a nuclear weapon on the tip. 
They come in a variety of different styles, but the key hang-up to getting any of them to work is figuring out how to miniaturize the weapons. This isn't like a plane where you can just kick a very heavy bomb out of the back. You have to have it be relatively lightweight to get the rocketry to work properly. We have seen, though, that it is possible to get nuclear weapons quite small. This is the Davy Crockett, which you will remember is a tactical nuclear weapon which was designed to be able to be picked up and used in a battle. This is actually much smaller than the type of weapon that you would want to put on a rocket, but if you have the ability to miniaturize like this, you can get a sizable weapon, but still relatively lightweight, onto a missile and use that to be able to fire at another country. The distance that these missiles can travel depends on the rocketry attached, as well as, of course, the weight of the nuclear weapon. If you have a shorter range, you're going to have to compensate for that with a more proximate launch point. That again was part of the reason why the United States and the Soviet Union had those four nuclear deployments. It's also central to understanding what went on during the Cuban Missile Crisis. When the Soviet Union began constructing missile bases in Cuba, the United States faced a new threat it had yet to see before. Cuba is just south of Florida, and thus, these weapons could strike Washington, D.C. Of course, the United States was doing something similar all along. You'll remember that the U.S. deployment map had Turkey colored in, and part of that is because the United States had Jupiter missiles based in Turkey. These had a range which, from Turkey, could hit the Soviet Union. And the big deal that happens to end the Cuban Missile Crisis is that the Soviet Union removes the missile bases from Cuba, and in exchange, later on, the United States removes these Jupiter missiles from Turkey. A better option is an Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, or ICBM for short. These will work from anywhere, hence the intercontinental part of the name. If you close your eyes for a moment and think about missiles sitting in a silo somewhere deep underground in Nebraska, those are ICBMs. They're waiting for someone to press a button, they'll pop the top, they'll fly off into space, they'll travel across the world, and then they'll start falling toward the Soviet Union. That's an ICBM. This is Atlas, the first US ICBM. And if you're thinking about what this looks like, and also recalling back to how I said the word space a moment ago, you might have a better appreciation for why the US saw Sputnik as such a scary thing. Yeah, Sputnik is just a radio transmitter, but consider the signal that it sends, and not just the radio signal. It is demonstrating that the Soviet Union has the ability to send things like this into space. So imagine what else they could be sending instead, perhaps a nuclear weapon. And it's that concern that is the impetus for the United States to start investing so much in its space program. The United States, of course, has received lots of great scientific benefits associated with having a space program, both during the Cold War and through today. But they were willing to funnel so much money to this program because it had the secondary benefit of helping the United States improve its nuclear weapons arsenal. The next major innovation was multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles, or MIRVs for short. And mercifully, MIRVs is a lot easier to say than the mouthful that it stands for. Regardless, with enough miniaturization, you can fit one of these ICBMs with multiple nuclear warheads. This is what that would look like. Each one of those cones is a nuclear warhead, and you're putting this on your ICBM. So think about what's happening here. You take an ICBM, you have it come out of the ground, it goes way, way, way up into the air. And then once it's up there, you have each of these warheads splitting off. And because they're splitting off, they can each go to a different target. So with a single rocket, you're saving a lot of money here, you can have multiple nuclear warheads target different cities and military installations. The final option is a submarine-launched ballistic missile. These more or less have the same principles as a regular ballistic missile, but they're launched out of a submarine instead. This is what that looks like, where you have a submarine that is below the surface of the sea, 
firing this missile. And once it's out there, we have that missile going to its target, just like a regular ballistic missile would. There are a couple of complications that come with this. We're not having the missile being fired off of land. That missile is actually coming from underwater. So not only do you need to have a submarine that can fit these missiles, but you also have to develop a system where you're using pressurized air to force these missiles to the surface, creating enough separation between the seawater and the missile for those rockets to launch, and then have the rockets go all the way to the target. The benefit here is that you don't necessarily need as long of a range of a missile. Yeah, it is possible to use an ICBM within a submarine. So you could have this thing hit somewhere all the way across the world. But if you don't have that ICBM technology, if you have your submarines simply located near where you are going to be firing them, you don't need as long of a range of the missile. Another benefit of submarine launched ballistic missiles is that they are very hard to counteract. It's possible to locate land-based nuclear weapons installations. There are some ways that states might try to play around with that by putting nuclear weapons on trains, for example, with the Soviet Union during the Cold War, and move those trains around the country so that the United States might not necessarily know exactly where they are. Or alternatively, you could put a nuclear weapon on a truck and do something very similar. But it is, in principle, possible to find those land-based installations, even if they're mobile. Planes, as we've talked about, are much easier to see and shoot down. It is very difficult to track a submarine, especially if you have a nuclear-powered submarine. So I'm talking about having nuclear weapons on a nuclear-powered submarine. So you have a nuclear reactor on the submarine to power the submarine. And when you have that sort of reactor on there, nuclear energy takes a very small amount of matter and creates a whole lot of energy with it. And as a consequence, those types of submarines don't need to come to the surface very often, and they don't need to come to port very often. They can stay underwater for a very, very long amount of time, which makes it very difficult for an opposing state to track them. And when you have that sort of secrecy, you're increasing the likelihood that you'll be able to use these sorts of weapons before the opposing state tries to destroy them in the event of war. And this is the George Washington, the first of those submarines to see use. And that's also the end of this lecture. We've now seen the different ways that you can deploy a nuclear weapon. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.